From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Let me take you back to late spring 1988. I got my first job in politics working on a presidential campaign headquarters in Boston. You might be able to guess the candidate. At any rate, I'm living at my parents' house in the suburbs. Campaigns don't pay much then, they don't pay much now, unless you field the polls or create the TV spots. And to get to work every day, I pop a few quarters into the receptacle on the T subway and take the green line from Woodland to Park Street. One of my office mates is another idealistic man named Tony West. Fast forward 31 years. I'm working here at the New York Stock Exchange, same time of year, May 9th to be specific. To get to work that day, I take out my iPhone, open up the Uber app. The car scoops me up a few minutes later, and before long, I'm overlooking the initial public offering of that very company. Ticker symbol Uber, U-B-E-R, from the balcony. And there's my old friend, Tony West, along with CEO Dara Khosrowshahi and John Thane, once the CEO of this place from 2004 to 2007, and now on Uber's board, watching closely as Pete Giacci from Citadel balances the buy and sell orders before the stock opens. How long we've come from that subway ride to that Uber ride on so many levels. We live in a world where the next great startup can change our lives in ways we couldn't possibly imagine. At first glance, names like Pinterest, Slack, Spotify, or Uber frankly sound strange to us, yet they've become etched into our daily routine, and for many, it's tough to imagine life without them. We're just past the halfway mark in 2019, and looking back on the first half of the year, three of those companies I mentioned, Slack, Pinterest, and Uber, have all gone public on the New York Stock Exchange, Spotify made its entrance last year, marking our first ever direct floor listing. Now, if I have to explain Uber to you, you've been living under a rock. Our own Jeff Sprecher, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, loves to point out that we put more trust in what people do with their fingers to rate the quality of one of those who drive us from point to point than we put in government. A parable for our time, really, about where trust is really formed. That trust is valuable. Building it and keeping it grows businesses, and losing it can make them founder. Uber has lived that story, founded a decade ago. It's a multinational transportation network company offering peer-to-peer ride-sharing, food delivery, and a bike and scooter sharing system. The tech company currently has an estimated 110 million customers with a market cap of $75.5 billion. Its shares traded right here under this roof. And while the Uber IPO is behind it, it continues to navigate its issues as a ride-sharing company. Its cop on the beat is Tony West, the company's general counsel, who was Dara's first hire when he came on board, bringing West on board in 2017 from PepsiCo, where he was GC under CEO Indra Nooyi. Preparing one of the largest IPOs ever listed in the U.S., the legal challenges facing ride-sharing, and what the future holds for transportation— our conversation with Tony West right after this. And now a word from Chip Berg, CEO of Levi Strauss and Company, NYSE ticker L-E-V-I. There's no other brand in the world like Levi's. We're here today because of the dedication of the 15,000 employees that we have around the world. Growth is being driven across the company. Men's, women's, tops, bottoms, outerwear. Virtually every country in the world grew last year. Being associated with an institution that goes back further than Levi's is special. This is where this company deserves to be. Tony West's career has taken him on a cross-country tour. It began on the quad of Harvard Yard, where Tony majored in government and served as publisher of the Harvard Political Review. After graduation, 
a first of several detours into politics, as I mentioned before the break, and then on to Stanford Law, where he served as president of the Stanford Law Review. And from there, his career has been a remarkable mix of work in both the public and private sector. Through it all, a passion for service and fighting for change remains core. Tony, welcome inside the Ice House. Josh, it is good to be with you, and I want you to know you have not changed in 30 years. Oh, come on now. <laughs> it's great I mean, to see you. I mean, I, I remember our days on Chauncey Street. We were just oh, kids. It was fantastic. 105 Chauncey Street, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny, the arc between then and now, I know that uh, for, for both of us, I think that was our first presidential and uh, presidential politics, let's just say, has changed quite a bit it in has. the last three decades. And not only has it changed a bit, and we'll get to this sort of the second half of the show, but you are right in the thick of it again, man. Right. That's true. That's true. Different vantage point. So last time you visited the New York Stock Exchange, it was when Uber was ringing the opening bell for what would be one of the largest IPOs ever listed in the United States. Mm. Share your thoughts and feelings going through your head at that moment when we met up that day. Oh, it was, it was such an amazing day in so many respects, right? First, I think it's a, an amazing uh, thing for any company to go public and the life journey of a company to be able to uh, meet that milestone is an incredible accomplishment. It was a day of great pride for so many people. Austin Geit, who is one of the first employees at uh, Uber, came as an intern, actually rang the bell. So for so many uh, of us, uh, old and new, uh, we felt great pride in having reached that milestone. But you know, part of it was because in many ways, uh, you know, we weren't really sure we'd ever get there, at least not get there as quickly as we did. Uh, when when Dara was hired, when I was hired, we were in a situation where we had a, a bet the company case uh, with, with Waymo uh, going on. We had lost our license to operate in London, mm -hmm. which is one of our largest markets. We had a, a, a board that was really at war with itself. There were actual lawsuits. And so when you fast forward 18 months after that point in time, the fact that we could be here at the stock exchange, uh, ringing the bell, joining the family of public companies is a really remarkable journey. I mean, Travis was here, Dara was here. That question about who will actually ring the opening bell is always one of, sort of one of the existential things a company faces. You go to Austin Geit, one of the earliest employees of Uber. She started as an intern, and there she was, the head of strategy for Uber's advanced tech group, the ATG. How did you settle on Austin as the person who's going to ring that bell? Well, it was, it was really Dara's decision, right? And, and it was not a, a difficult decision at all. It, it was almost, it was interesting sort of, you know, hearing the conversation. I, I won't say it was obvious, but it was almost obvious that that was the right thing. And once folks had, had settled on that, which was very, very quick, um, the decision was made not to tell Austin to make it a surprise until, you know, fairly close to the day. And, and amazingly, we were able to keep that secret. So you say it was a moment that almost never happened, given all of the complexities running up to that moment. But you do get there, the run up to the IPO from those initial discussions to the roadshow. How was the experience going through the IPO process? You've been at a company, PepsiCo, founded in 1898. Uber was founded in 2009, a very different animal to ride legal herd over. That's right. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because the the IPO journey itself is is just a unique experience. And I'm, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to participate in that. I will say that, you know, one of the, the things that is most memorable uh, of that whole process is the roadshow. I, I joined uh, Nelson, our CV, CEO, uh, CFO, excuse me, and, uh, and Dara, An alumni the CEO. of this organization. That, absolutely right, and Nelson Shea. And uh, joined the two of them on the road. And so we spent a lot of time together. And it gave us an opportunity to reflect about how far the company had come in such a short period of time, but also how remarkable it was to uh, be stepping into this new, new, almost this new incarnation of who we were as a company, the responsibility that comes with that, the accountability that comes with that. It was all, you know, somewhat uh, momentous for us. And so I, I really enjoyed not only spending, you know, we all spent probably you know, more time with each other than we ever planned to, but it was a really great opportunity to both reflect and prepare 
uh, as we thought about, you know, the company and where it ought to go. News coverage coming out of the roadshow was very positive. You don't, you're not saying anything, but you are getting sort of some reporting, some leaks, maybe from people that you're meeting with across the table. Anything through that process sort of throw you for a loop or was it all pretty much what you expected? You know, I think it was actually pretty much what we expected. I, you know, by the time we went on the road, we had a very good sense of what our challenges were, of what investors would be most interested in. And we had a very clear sense of where we wanted to take the company. And so putting all of that together in a narrative that was cogent and persuasive, that kind of preparation really, I think, meant that on the road, we really didn't get anything that was unexpected. You know, we got pressed, certainly, on certain issues, obviously, path of profitability. Um, you know, what's the, what's the power of the platform mean, and how do you harness the leverage across that platform, things that you've learned in rides and eats, how do you leverage that in freight, and how do you leverage it in Nemo and other big bets? But we expected that. And we expected to be put to the test. And, uh, and I think uh, we did pretty well. You've sat in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee several times for Senate confirmation, I think. You've had to rehearse your script. You've had to go through murder boards of the toughest questions the senators would throw at you as you're on the road show doing this same pitch, the same narrative over and over again. You can tell me how many times, but did you ever get <laughs> tired of listening to the same story coming out of your Nelson's and Dara's mouth? All the time. It, it was funny because there was definitely a point in the road show where we knew each other's scripts so well, we could easily fill in. And indeed, sometimes we would take questions that weren't sort of in our own bailiwick simply because we, we understood you know, the answers pretty well at that point. That was, uh, that was kind of funny. I think one of the hardest things, though, when you're going through this is trying to remember what stories and what uh, examples you've already given so that you're not repeating yourself in the same meeting. And that you have to really kind of pay attention for that. So prior to the opening bell that day, May 9th, Dara shared an Uber ride with CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin. I want to hear what Dara had to say about the future of mobility and what it looks like through Uber. Let's hear a listen. What is the future of mobility actually look like? First of all, it's got to be electric, right? Uh, we think that's a no-brainer. It's good for the environment. It's where the world is going, and we're playing our part, for example, in London to move it electric. Uh, we think mobility has to be shared. Uh, we're sharing this ride. We're investing in pool technology to get more than one person into a vehicle. Um, new is we believe it's got to be multimodal in that cars can't be the only transportation solution in cities and we have to create other transportation solutions such as bikes and scooters and I think we are at the very beginning of the personal electric uh, mobility revolution within urban centers that I'm very, very optimistic about. We think that transportation is going to go vertical just as residential buildings have gone vertical, especially here in New York. Vertical in the air. In the air, if you've got cities in three dimensions and getting higher and higher and higher, you cannot have a transportation grid that's in two dimensions. You I mean, it's a fascinating conversation, Tony, and I want to break it down maybe in four quick parts, because after I saw you on the floor, I started looking at your Twitter feed, and I know that you have this unique perch as general counsel. You go to a lot of events. You see a lot of incredible things. You tweet out a lot of pictures of the stuff you're seeing. And you've begun to experience a lot of the things that Dara is imagining just in that quick little response to what Sorkin says. So let's begin. Future's got to be electric. Future has to be electric, absolutely. And, and this is where we have great opportunities to partner with cities around the world. Congestion is a real concern, and it's important for us to have a proposition for cities that don't add to that issue. When you add to that climate change and all of the concerns around climate, uh, we want to make sure that the transportation solutions that we are offering to cities and the partnerships that we're offering to cities actually makes things better from a climate perspective instead of exacerbating uh, the problem. And so whether you're talking about electric vehicles, where we have partnered with uh, the mayor of London to commit to an all-electric vehicle fleet, 
by time certain, or you talk about the fact that when we think about the future of moving people over cities through Elevate, through VTOL, which are which will be vertical takeoff and landing, and those will be all electric, and everything in between, right, uh, bikes and scooters, what have you, electric really is the, the, the one concept unifying theory that connects all of that. I was going to go through all four of them, but you covered them there. But I want to hone in on VTOL a little bit because it does give you this image of one of the later Star Wars movies and so much other science fiction where people are moving through space and cities are very vertical, whether they are suspended in the air or just going up 100 floors. I mean, Tony, you come from government and politics. You came from, you know, soft drinks and snacks at PepsiCo. Now you're in the middle of this. Does it blow your mind? (laughs) It, well, well, it definitely blows your mind just being able to spend time with some of the smartest people on the planet who are thinking of how to move people in different ways, more efficient ways, cleaner ways. So it's a privilege in that in that respect to be able to work with some of the smartest people in the world. But it's also a natural outgrowth of, of where we need to go when it comes to effectively, efficiently moving people from point A to point B. If you think about electric vehicles, for instance, if you think about cars and you think about autonomous, you know, clearly when you think about autonomous vehicles, you know, what we want to see is a transition uh, over time to an autonomous fleet that is completely uh, electric and is uh, smart enough to move people effectively and efficiently from point A to point B. Interestingly enough, we, we, we see for a long period of time uh, always to have the need for human drivers because, you know, what what computers are good at, the repetition, uh, repetitive tasks, the kinds of things which are fairly straightforward to negotiate, humans are much better at the complex tasks of, of driving. So even in that transition to, uh, to electric autonomous, you know, you're always going to need to have human drivers in that equation. And for those human drivers, making sure that they have access to electric vehicles, clean vehicles, uh, solutions like that is important. Human drivers and human passengers, no matter how they are transported, whether behind the wheel or autonomously, they got to eat. And on the day of the IPO, just outside the stock exchange on Experience Square, representatives from Uber Eats were on hand doling out Egg McMuffins and Quarter Pounders to promote your food delivery partnership with McDonald's. Explain how Uber Eats is growing and how it's opened up a whole new channel for Uber, not only as a ride-sharing company, but as a food delivery service. Well, it's growing very, very quickly. I think when you look at the growth rates there, and this is not just true for Uber Eats, it's also going to be true for for uh, other other uh, food delivery services uh, that you see, but you know clearly it is a it is a high growth business for us, and it, it's exciting because we we view it as part of our core, and we believe that uh, when this idea of being able to create enormous selection for individuals to be able to get whatever they want in terms of food. Right from the you know basically their restaurant of choice within 30 minutes, that is an amazing concept, and it's one that we continue to execute and perfect over time uh, with Uber Eats. It's interesting too because you know there's an interesting tie-in to the VTOL technology because you know part of what we are developing is not just to be able to serve urban centers effectively through through Uber Eats. But also, as we develop our drone technology, we develop VTOL technology, the ability to be able to make sure that that same kind of time horizon, short time horizon, um, is accessible to people, uh, even in the suburbs, to be able to order from their favorite restaurant downtown. So before 2017, you're an average guy like me. You're either living in Washington, probably using Uber to get home from the DOJ after one of those late nights, or you're up in Purchase, New York at Pepsi's headquarters doing the same thing. And you have no idea that eventually the call is going to come from Dara. But we all had our perceptions of this business that we were increasingly relying on, whether for transportation or to get a 
to get a meal delivered to us. But what are your perceptions of the company before you even got that call? What were you thinking about as you watched <laughs> some of the news unfold, frankly, that wasn't always that favorable? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was very aware of what was going on in 2017. In fact, I mean, to your point, I was at PepsiCo. Here, true story. I'm meeting with a uh, uh, one of my lawyers in uh, the spring of 17 in my office at PepsiCo. And, you know, after the meeting, there's a New York Times on the table and I pick it up and I start to read it. And there's this front page story above the fold all about Uber, you know, delete Uber, the Susan Fowler blog, the troubles with the board. I, and it just it went into this, this, this horror story about what was going on. And I remember finishing that, that article and, and tossing the paper on my table and saying to, saying to my colleague, man, I'm glad I'm not the GC of that company. They've got some real problems. And, you know, of course, fast forward a few months, and now I'm the GC of that company with some real problems. But one of the things that was so attractive to the, to the opportunity was when you think about what an incredible brand proposition Uber is. It is not only a brand that is ubiquitous, it's a brand that has really, as you pointed out in your intro, seeped deeply into our pop culture, our social culture, our nomenclature. Uber is both a noun and a verb. When a brand reaches that type of saturation, coupled with the kind of scale that Uber has, we do 16 million rides a day, mm. you know, for at least 45 rides per second, right? When you put all of that together, it creates an opportunity to have real impact at scale. And so, you know, for me, and I know, Josh, you're very similar in this way, you know, I've always tried to choose those opportunities that I would pursue from a career standpoint. You know, go to a place that's making a difference where you can make an impact. And when you put those two things together, as I think we've done here at Uber, I think you can demonstrate that you can really make a huge positive impact by, you know, taking, taking a chance, as it were. You know, at the time, people weren't so sure uh, I was doing <laughs> the right thing. But I think, you know, looking back, I think there's no question that I made the right decision. So you're at the Pepsi HQ, you're reading the paper, you're tossing it on the table in a sort of Obama-like way. I'm glad I don't work there. But then you do get the call. I mean, how does Dara find you and what are your thoughts and how quickly does it turn over that, you know, you're going to move out west? I think it, it took a, a little bit of time in terms of you know, them reaching out to me. They had reached out to me and and had some initial conversations. Initially, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't interested. This is before Dara came on board. And then after Dara started... Um, of course, they had gone through then the Eric Holder report, the Holder report, my, my former boss and, and friend, good friend, who, who, who had really done a top to bottom look at, at Uber's culture and governance and made some very specific recommendations uh, in his report. They went through that process in the summer of 17. Uh, Dara's hiring was, was actually one of the outgrowths of that report. And at that point, they reached back out to me. And, you know, you know, there were a number of folks, including Eric, who, who suggested that, you know, I should just go and, 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 and meet uh, Dara. And so we did. We met here in New York. We met at a, uh, at a steakhouse uh, on 6th. And, uh, and what was supposed to be a 30-minute a meeting turned into an hour-long meeting where we were talking about this incredible company, which I had fallen in love with as a consumer right. you know, years before, right? So I was already someone who really had it on my phone, used it all the time. But this incredible company, the challenges it was facing, what it would take to turn around the culture, to turn around the legal problems, to begin to unlock the enormous potential that this company had, and the fact that he needed a partner in, in getting that done. And I left that meeting in a very different mind space in terms of both thinking about what an incredible opportunity this was. Um, clearly, the challenges the company was facing at that time really fit my, my, my resume. They needed help with regulators. I'd been a regulator. You know, they needed someone who understood the governance of a public company. I'd been the GC of one of the largest uh, public companies in the world. And so when you begin to put it all together, it seemed like such a, a perfect match. And the rest, as they say, is history. 
there's so many things that you've had to tackle when you walk through the door. I want to sort of tick through three that probably have engendered a bunch of news articles in their own right, but you know, get get a sense from you like problem solution, how you addressed these issues as they came up. First, you know, independent workers. In June, Dara penned a joint op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle with Logan Green and John Zimmer, the co-founders of Lyft, on the topic of independent workers also known as contractors, and the legal challenges surrounding current employment laws. How do you weigh in on the subject right now and what steps Uber is taking to address independent workers' rights? So we're actually talking with stakeholders, namely labor, in trying to create a framework that would address independent work. You know, next time you're in an Uber, ask your driver, Mm -hmm. you know, what's the thing they like most about driving. They may tell you some things they don't like, you know, and I listen to that too because it's important feedback from from our customer. But almost universally, what they'll tell you they like is the flexibility. Mm -hmm. Nobody tells them when to go to work, how to work, where to drive. They make those decisions every time they decide to, to do a trip. And that independence, you know, they can work they can work for three weeks straight and then not work for six months and then come right back onto the platform. As long as they are in good standing, meaning you know they, they haven't you know, committed any crimes mm-hmm. or done anything that would uh, get them deactivated from the platform, they always have the opportunity to work and always have the opportunity to engage. And that's a powerful, on their terms, that's a very powerful thing. And so the question is, how do we... How do we create a framework that allows for the flexibility of independent work while at the same time allowing for and providing the same kinds of securities that you do find in traditional employment? Because it is important for people not to feel like they have to make this choice between flexibility and security. You ought to be able to have both in a 21st century economy. And so what does security look like? Security looks like portable benefits that are robust you know, paid time off. If something happens to you or to your vehicle, you know, there's a way in which you can still make an income. Access to lifelong learning opportunities, you know, robust benefits, as well as transparency and stability in earnings. One of the things that we do here that that uh, can sometimes be a pain point for drivers is their inability to predict exactly how much, you know, they're going to earn. Or at least, you know, sometimes you go out and you'll drive and you'll make a whole bunch. And then other times you'll go out and you'll drive and you won't make much at all. Mm -hmm. And so being able to kind of plan a little bit better and understand what the stability of that earnings flow looks like is an important thing for drivers. And so one of the things we put on the table is in California, in our conversations in California, are sort of similar to the driver earning standard that we have here in New York, we would certainly endorse a a standard driver earnings standard so that drivers can have a floor. They can always make more, but at least a floor that would be an earning standard plus expenses so that there is some stability and some guarantee that that they won't dip below a certain level. And so trying to make sure that we create those things plus um, a way for for drivers to be heard, for them to be represented, for their voices to to be uh, a part of the process when we're setting standards and setting policies that govern the rideshare industry, we want to be able to create a mechanism that will allow them to have that voice. And so when you put those kind of three pillars together, you know, robust benefits, an earning standard, plus expenses, and a way to have some a representation that is meaningful. Those are three legs of a stool that I think begin to create a framework for independent work in the 21st century that is meaningful, that's work with dignity, and offers both flexibility and security. You ever sign up on the platform and, and take some sample rides to sort of see what it's like? So, so I, I, I have downloaded the app. Um, we have to do a couple of things because if I drive around San Francisco, too many people, I think, would uh, recognize me. So yeah. I've got, I, can only, I can't drive in San Francisco, but we're looking for a place where I can actually uh, be a driver myself. The second big issue, very serious one, safety. Again, you're coming from servicing government and also a a huge company that always worries about product safety, but product safety as it relates to what you deliver at Uber. Safety is is priority number one. This is one of the main things that I've focused on since I've come to Uber is how do you improve the safety of the platform, particularly 
uh, the safety of the platform for women. Because if you make it safer for women, you're going to make it safer for everyone. We know from the New York Times and other sources that women experience travel differently, that they think of things, have to, are forced really to think of uh, and consider things that, that men simply take for granted. And so if we begin to think about creating a platform that meets that high safety bar, then it's one that, that works universally. And, you know, you talked about trust in the beginning, in the opening to the podcast. You know, trust is something you have to earn every day. And part of the way you earn that trust is by always striving to be the safest uh, platform that will transport people from point A to point B. And whether that's asking people to entrust you with the safety of themselves or their loved ones, or you're asking them to, to trust you with, with their data, safety has to be at the core of what people think of when they think, you know, I want to go and, and take an Uber here or there. And so we spend a lot of time, we invest a lot in the technology, we've uh, rolled out a number of product features which enhance the safety of the platform. We've got the SOS mm -hmm. button, of course, that'll, you know, automatically connect you with 911 if that's uh, necessary. We have a way to to contact, to, to, to put in trusted contacts so that loved ones that you have or friends can can know exactly when you're taking a trip, where it begins, where it ends. I, my wife uses this all the time with me. I see every trip that she that she does, and it gives me great peace of mind. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of other things in the safety toolkit which which we hope will will continue to enhance the safety of the product, and we're continuing to to iterate on that and trying to improve that every day. So I'll just do one more with you, which is the third, and that's autonomous transportation. In March of 2018, just a few months after you came on board, a self-driving Uber killed a pedestrian. That interview Dara did with Andrew Ross Sorkin was in a self-driving car. The issues of what autonomous transportation means are myriad, but how does it relate to the legal issues that you got to you got to wrestle with? Well, look, I mean, you know, the the autonomous vehicle industry is a nascent industry, and when you look at other industries, whether it's aviation uh, or any other industry like that, it obviously goes through uh, goes through a period where you know, it's continually trying to become more and more safe. And that's going to be true for, for our industry as well. I will tell you that our company, and particularly folks who worked in the ATG unit, were absolutely heartbroken when Ms. Hertzberg was killed in Tempe, Arizona, by that, by that autonomous vehicle. And one of the first things we did was to order a top-to-bottom safety review, which is not remarkable. Again, this happens in, in the aviation industry, for instance, if, if there is a, a, a... It happened in the Apollo program. Here we are 50 years after Apollo 11, and Apollo 1 had a terrible safety accident, and it caused them to stand down and, and look top to bottom at the whole program. That's exactly right. And, and we did the same thing, too. We grounded our fleet. We did a top to bottom safety review. We hired Chris Hart, uh, who's a former chairman of the NTSB, to put together a team and to conduct that review. But one thing we, we did, which was different than what you'd see in most industries. We did not shroud that report under attorney-client privilege because what we decided we would do, and we decided this early on, is that it was important for this to be a public report. It was important because we knew this was a very critical moment in a nascent industry. We knew the way that we reacted to this accident, the first fatality of uh, involving in a, an autonomous vehicle. We knew the way that we reacted to that would set a precedent. And so we wanted to make sure that we set the right precedent. And, you know, when we came in, we, Dara and I, we have a, we have a, a North Star called do the right thing, period. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone in the company is familiar with that. And we decided that to do the right thing here would be to make this report public. And so that's what we did. You can find it on the internet today. And what it does is it shows you what our safety profile looked like. It shows you the things that we did right, shows you things that we can improve on. But we think that's an important metric of public accountability that will continue to help us improve uh, our safety profile, not just at ATG, um, but throughout the company. 
one of your goals upon arriving at Uber was to build a world-class legal team. And in order to achieve that, you knew your team needed to bring a diverse set of opinions and experiences. In fact, I think what we found was that 10 of the 14 people you hired or promoted to join your team were women. And you were quoted as saying, you have to be intentional. You have to walk the talk. Explain that for our listeners. Well, it, it means just that, right? I mean, we we talked about doing the right thing. I talked about the importance of acting with transparency, integrity, and accountability in everything we did. And I talked about the importance of being intentional about reaching diversity goals. In fact, yesterday we just uh, released our diversity report. And uh, what it shows is it shows we've made progress. We've made progress, but we're not yet there. And in fact, you are never there uh, because when when you're talking about diversity and inclusion, when you're talking about culture, it's not a destination. It's always a journey. There's always improvement. And so you know, while I'm glad there was improvement, I think that report also shows that there's there's more work to be done, much more work to be done. You know, that said, it's important that part of how do you get that work done is that you are looking at your numbers and you're thinking about the values that you want to bring into your company that you want to reflect out from your company, and you're making sure your actions are consistent with those values. So if, if diversity and inclusion is a value, and it is for us, then you have to be intentional when you're thinking of hiring and promoting and retaining. You have to think about that value and how you want that to be expressed. You have to think about it in terms of who you hire as third-party vendors, the law firms that we hire, or the other uh, third-party vendors that we hire to do work for us. They need to re- also reflect those values that we, that we talk about. And so being mindful and intentional about making that one of the criteria that you use when you choose those outside vendors. That's what, that's what walking the talk, I think, uh, also means. And, and it's, uh, it, it's interesting, too, because um, if you do that, if you set out, and, and if you set out really to build the best possible team, everything in my experience tells me that team will be diverse. You know, we've already, we already know, you know, whether it's Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School or McKinsey, all of the studies which tell us that diverse teams make better decisions, which tell us that, you know, firms with more women in leadership positions and management actually have better financial returns. There's lots of data out there which, which tells us that when you actually try to build the best of the best, it will be diverse. We love the fact that you come back to the New York Stock Exchange after your May 9th IPO. We love to be a convener of major events and conversation about important issues. You're back here this evening for a fireside chat with Amanda Wynn, who's the founder and CEO of RISE, which is a non-governmental civil rights organization working with multiple state legislatures and Congress to implement a sexual assault survivor's bill of rights. I want to hear a clip from the Women's March on the National Mall in Washington, where Amanda shared her story to thousands of those who were in attendance. We, today, of every color, creed, and belief, are gathered here in a demonstration of the American story. Today, you might feel scared, and I know what it feels like to be scared. My name is Amanda Wynn, and I am a rape survivor. And I remember, after my rape, I felt despair, but I also felt fire. So when I met a broken criminal justice system, like so many survivors who find out that their untested rape kits can be destroyed, I rewrote the law. Tony, Amanda wrote and advocated for the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights, which was signed into law by President Obama in October 2016. Much of your public service career was spent prosecuting sexual predators. How did you become associated with RISE and its mission? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, actually a fireside chat in which uh, Amanda and I will talk about the importance of women's safety and particularly the importance of women's safety as an enabler to independence, to agency, uh, to mobility. And, and uh, you know, Amanda is an amazing, amazing individual, well-deserving of the Nobel Peace Prize nomination that she has. Um, but one of the most exciting things I think she's done is through Rise Now uh, is that she's, she's helped people to understand their own power 
in moving the political process. In addition to the Survivors' Bill of Rights that she was able to not only get passed through Congress, but get it passed unanimously in a bipartisan way through Congress, which is something we almost never see, right? She's been able to go on and pass 22 other bills and make them law. And she's been able to reach out to individuals, train individuals around the country, activists who have issues that really relate to civil rights. And she's been able to help them take advantage of the the legislative levers of power to not only pin these civil rights into law, but to get them passed and to create a narrative that helps others to even folks they may disagree with politically to be able to see the value in passing some of this legislation. So it's a really, really remarkable thing and gift that she's given to so many people around the world. How can more people get involved with what Amanda's doing? Well, rise it's uh, risenow.us is where you can go and you can look at, the, they've just started something called the the, the Justice Lab, and it really is aimed at training individuals, just like you would think of any startup a person, an entrepreneur has a great idea and they go and they seek seed funding. What she is doing is she's finding social activists, civil rights advocates who have great ideas in terms of how do we augment the legislative framework around our civil rights protections. And she's finding those folks with good ideas and she's giving them seed funding to help them advocate for those ideas and to get them uh, into uh, legislation. After the break, Tony and I take a look back at his early days in public service and the private sector, his love of politics and what lies ahead for Uber and its future. That's right after this. And now a word from Teladoc, NYSC ticker TDOC. When I get sick, I'm too busy to reschedule my day. And that's why I use Teladoc. I don't need to wait. I can talk with a U.S. board-certified doctor by phone or video within minutes who can diagnose, treat, and prescribe medication for conditions like the flu, bronchitis, allergies, and more. For me, my family, even my coworkers, 24-7, anywhere, anytime. They've already connected over 4 million patients to get the care they need. So what are you waiting for? Visit teledoc.com. Back now with Tony West, Chief Legal Officer at Uber. Before the break, Tony and I were talking about Uber's historic IPO and some of the exciting new offerings the technology company is unveiling to expand modern transportation as we know it. Tony, as I said earlier, you know, I once we connected again, I went back and looked at so many of her tweets. And I look at I look at your Twitter feed now, and there's a picture across the top of President Obama gazing out from behind bars, which I presume might be Robin Island. What does the picture represent to you? So, uh, first of all, I'm flattered that you think that was President Obama. That was actually me gazing out of, yes, you were right, Nelson Mandela's cell at Robben Island. I, I went there when I... I saw gray in the head, and I don't see any gray oh, hair. Oh, no, there's gray. There's, okay. It's just really short right now, <laughs> Josh. There's lots of gray. <laughs> but um, but I, that was a trip that I took in 2014, I was uh, speaking in South Africa in Cape Town, and and I'd wanted to go to Robben Island. And when we went there, it was great. One of the, you know, we were able to arrange a, a, a special tour because I was the associate attorney general. And of course, it was led by a former inmate, which is one of the incredible things about going to Robben Island. Sadly, so many of them are are, are passing away now because of age, but, but it was an incredible tour, and, in, and it just reminded you. It just was such a, such a strong reminder of uh, how important and profound it is to stand up for ideals, even when your personal liberty is at stake, and really understanding what Mandela went through during the time that he was incarcerated, seeing what that daily life was like, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a powerful, powerful trip for me. It, you know, it's also just a reminder of the ideals that are so universal. You know, they're ideals that are reflected in our Declaration of Independence. They're ideals that we constantly strive to achieve and to actually manifest in our own civic life. We're not always perfect at doing that, but we, we continue to try to do that. But it's a reminder that those values of freedom, of equality, 
of justice, those are values that are universal. They exist not just here in the United States, but they're held by so many people around the world, which is why the United States is the beacon that it is for so many people around the world. And it's worth remembering that. And it's worth having a spirit of charity. It's worth having a spirit of humility. It's worth having a spirit that is welcoming because we are in a very privileged position to be able to mm-hmm. to be that. You were born in San Francisco, grew up in San Jose. Your father, Franklin West, was born in Georgia, became the first person in his family to go to college and later work for IBM. Your mom, Peggy, born in Alabama, later became a teacher. How did that upbringing affect the outlook you have today? Well, I, you know, both of my parents, as, as you note, are f- from the Deep South. They grew up in the Jim Crow Deep South. And one of the things they decided was that they would not raise their children in the Deep South, in the segregated South. And so before I was born, they moved to California where they didn't know a soul Mm. and uh, settled in San Francisco. Uh, And that's where I was born. And then later my two younger sisters were born when we were in San Jose. And, you know, my dad was a remarkable Man, because you know, very much self-made. I mean, someone who 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 sent himself to college, the first in his family to go to college, born dirt poor, is, is uh, you know, to a family of sharecroppers, and believed in education as if it were hmm. a religion. Really, because that was you know that was the thing that for my dad unlocked horizons into which he'd not been born that he could access opportunity that simply would not have been available to him had it not been his drive for education and to be educated. And so, you know, raising raising my two younger sisters and me, that was really one of the core, core values of the household, the importance of gaining an education. And so that was reflected in everything that we did. You know, it's interesting because when when I reflect on his life journey, he, he passed away, you know, much too young when I was the associate attorney general. You know, when I reflect on, on his life journey or if I reflect on my mother-in-law's life journey who, who came to this country in 1959 from India as a teenager and pursued a Ph.D. and became a breast cancer research scientist— and raised her two daughters, right? Um, When I think about their life journeys, uh, I think about the fact that they represent the best of who we are as America. Their stories are only possible in this country, and the fact that they lived out those lives and were able to raise their families to be able to uh, unlock opportunities that, that they'd not been born into, I think speaks a lot about the, the potential Uh, and the greatness of the country. And it also, you know, reminds us uh, how important it is to preserve that. Education as if it were religion, your dad's mantra. In the early 80s, Tony, you left Northern California for the Northeast where you attended Harvard. Everyone has their own story of how their first education or college experience affected them. How did going to Cambridge affect you? Well, I, I, I was a kid who'd, you know, been born and raised on the, on the West Coast, so I didn't know anything about the, the East Coast. It was a very different kind of environment. But a very important part of my, my education, a very important part of, of, of who, I, who I've become, because kind of understanding those different cultures, and they are different cultures, understanding those different cultures, being exposed to racism in its starkest forms for the first time when I was... Uh, in Cambridge and Boston, and learning how to navigate and negotiate that was extremely important to my growth as a person. And so, I, you know, I'm very really thankful for for the opportunity to have been able to go to not just Harvard, but to actually be able to live in Cambridge, to live in Boston, where you and I met on the Dukakis campaign, and to feel very much at home on the East Coast, as much at home on the East Coast as I do on the West Coast. 
So skipping over, because we, we are limited on time, Tony, of, of your time back at Stanford Law and, and running the, the law review, I want to get to Washington, D.C., because once you get there, it can often be a hard place to leave. Your first position there was working for the Department of Justice in 1993 as a special assistant under Philip Heyman, then the deputy attorney general. What did you take away from your time there? I, we can't skip over the fact that the most important thing I got out of law school was my wife, Maya Harris. Um, who I met in my first year. But then fast forward to uh, the Department of Justice. When I, um, I, I worked for Phil, Phil was actually, he was the number two, the Deputy Attorney General. He actually left not too long after I got there. It was only, I think, within six months. Mm-hmm. He left. Uh, Jamie Gorelick came in. But in that transition, I ended up just doing a lot of work directly for the Attorney General Janet Reno. And that was the most important thing that I, I, I got from that experience. And in fact, my, my experience working for Ms. Reno really shaped who, who I became as a lawyer. You know, she was a remarkable, remarkable woman and really was one of my first mentors in the law. She had been a prosecutor in Florida, a state's attorney, and, and loved that work, loved that public service. And I always think that she probably took pity on me, but she took an interest in me and, and you know, would often tell me that she thought I would be a good uh, prosecutor, a good trial attorney one day. And so, you know, after having been at Maine Justice for a year or so, I did get this opportunity to become a federal prosecutor back in my home home state, uh, California, in my home city in San Jose. And she couldn't have been happier And the thing that I will always carry with me was a great gift she gave me right before I left to go back to California. She asked to see me one-on-one in her office, and she wanted to talk to me about what it meant to be a federal prosecutor. And, And during that meeting, she took me to this little room that's actually outside of the attorney general's private office. In, in the main justice building. And it's this wood that's got wood paneled walls and in it are carved the words uh, from a Supreme Court case that essentially says the United States wins its point when justice is done. And what Ms. Reno told me was, I want you to remember that your job as a federal prosecutor, Tony, is not to go out and win as many cases as you possibly can. Your job is to do justice in every single Mm. matter that you handle. And that was a powerful charge. I think I was 28, 29 years old, and not only was it a powerfully inspiring charge coming from anybody, the fact that it was coming from the Attorney General of the United States made it all the more so. And so it not just shaped my view of how do I approach my work as a public prosecutor, It shaped my view of what it meant to be a lawyer, that as as a lawyer, whether I was in the private sector or the public sector, my job really was to try to figure out how to do the right thing, how to do the right thing, period. And so even when it was hard, and so whenever, you know, I got into those situations where, you know, you might be called on to represent an unpopular client who's been asking for a lawyer and has not been getting that lawyer, or if you have to decline the representation of a wealthy corporate client because you don't believe in that representation. Or in those moments, and I've had a number of those moments in my career, I would always think about what Ms. Reno told me. And it would always give me the strength to be able to, to, to make the hard choice. And so, you know, when you fast forward all the way to today, in that meeting I had with Dara in that steakhouse, you know, imagine imagine how I felt when he said, you know, one of the North Stars that we have here is to do the right thing, period. I said, I, I think I can do that. I think you can do that, too. I mean, much to President Clinton's chagrin, Ms. Reno ran an apolitical justice department, and it's certainly a very different beast now than it was back then. And you mentioned the one of the great benefits you got out of attending Stanford Law School, which is your spouse, Maya Harris. 
She's got a very impressive sister who is the attorney general of California, now the junior senator from California and presidential candidate Kamala Harris. And running this vast legal operation for Uber and yet maybe taking a July 4th break on the hustings (laughs) in Iowa and uh, hanging out with the farmers and everything else in those 99 counties that I've had such great times in myself. How do you keep the balance between, you know, the focus on the corporate work and, you know, the, the family effort that's currently going on. Well, I mean, if I wanted to see my wife or my family for July 4th, I had to go to Iowa. So that, that was that was why I, I ended up going. Uh, look, uh, Maya is uh, the campaign chair and is, I think, is doing a phenomenal job. And, you know, Kamala could have no better person who is helping to lead this this effort. Kamala, I think, is an incredible public servant, an incredible person, but an incredible public servant. You know, look, as a, as a family member, she makes me proud. And as a citizen, she gives me hope. And so I, I, uh, I, I couldn't be prouder of both of them. But, um, but, but thankfully, the, the hard, hard work and heavy lifting is really done by, uh, by the senator and by her, her sister, the campaign chair. So as we wrap up, Tony West, you recently sat down with the New York Times columnist David Gellis about how action, not just talk, is crucial to demonstrating Uber's commitment to safety and transparency. What else should we be on the lookout for from Uber in terms of the evolution of its corporate culture? Well, I think the evolution of corporate culture is never finished. I think we've made a very good start, right? Uh, You know, at the top of uh, the podcast, you know, I talked about how we had a bet the company case with Waymo. We settled that case. Those adversaries are now investors. Uh, I talked about how we had a bore at war with itself. Those matters have been settled. We now have an independent chair, and we are a model of governance, not just for tech companies, but for any company. I talked about the fact that we had lost our license to operate in London. We now have a provisional license back, and we hope that we are on track to get a more permanent license later this year. And so I, I think all of that is, is evidence that the culture is changing at Uber, but it's not done. We have a long way to go. We still have to, to grapple with these issues that are intractable, intractable for a lot of companies, but you know, particularly for us, because of the spotlight, I think people really kind of are, are noticing and, and taking notice. And we welcome that attention, by the way, because it's important for accountability. So you know, when it comes to DNI, we have more work to do. When it comes to improving the safety of our platform, particularly for women, you know, I know that we can continue to make strides there. I'm proud of how far we've been able to come, but I'm also very clear-eyed about the fact that we have more work to do. And I can't wait to get a chicken parm delivered to my high-rise apartment window through VTOL. Absolutely. It is coming. It is coming. (laughs) On that note, Tony, I look forward to watching Uber revolutionize the ride-sharing industry and so many other aspects of what the company is doing and making strides in improving diversity and ethics in the workplace. Thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks for coming back to the New York Stock Exchange. Come back anytime and use this as your platform. Thank you so much, Josh. It's great to see you. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Tony West, general counsel of Uber. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Teresa DeLuca with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host. Signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 